Thank you. Um, hi Ron, my name is Katie Tate. I'm the CEO and the founder of Tango Old Brew Foundation, and we coordinate the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. Um, and very happy to be here to talk to you about a project that we've been running for about oh, just over a year now called Project Recon. It's one of our source reduction um, projects, which is where we use our data to try and identify some issue and find a solution to. We go. So I would also like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting on today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so for those of you that don't know Tangaroa Blue, we are a charity that was formed in 2004 in Western Australia and we focus on marine debris. So we do a lot of clean up activities both in freshwater and in saltwater. Uh, we collect data on everything that we're removing and we try and track that debris back to the source so we can try and figure out where it's coming from. Once you have a bit of an understanding of where it's coming from, then you can bring the right stakeholder group to the table uh, to try and find a solution to identify the actual point of loss. Um, and that's why our data is actually quite, um, quite I don't know, detailed. Um, if you think about collecting a bottle that's plastic, you can record a plastic bottle, you can record it as a plastic water bottle, you can record it as a plastic water bottle that has a particular brand, and then you can record it as a plastic water bottle with a particular brand and a particular barcode. So you can see that you kind of go into details. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, if we're standing on a Cape York beach and we have a look at a plastic water bottle that actually comes from overseas, the strategy to prevent that from occurring in the future will be completely different than if that water bottle was left there from a local community member as litter. So without that level of detail, we won't actually know um, where that source is. And if we look at, for example, data in Queensland from the container deposit scheme, seeing what impact that has on litter, we know the container deposit scheme has had a massive impact on beverage containers in our urban areas, but it has had zero impact on the beaches in Cape York and that's because 99% of the rubbish in Cape York is coming from overseas. So without having that layer of detail, we're not really going to know whether our strategies, our intervention measures are having any kind of impact or not. Um, so I'd like to talk to you guys about ghost gear as a particular type of item that we've been tracking. We know that um, ghost nets are considered one of the most horrible items in our marine environment for our marine wildlife. Um, they can entangle, they can um, drown animals, and we know that ghost nets in particular can be you know, a very small piece, but they can also be up to the size of a football field or even bigger. So they're quite a, uh, a unique item, <laughs> and they can be quite challenging to remove once they are located. They reckon around 2% of all fishing gear is lost um, in, in the environment, so that there's this accumulative effect of more and more gear getting lost every year. And in the Gulf of Carpentaria, where ghost nets have been shown to be probably one of the more um, impactful marine debris items, or that's where we see a lot of them, um, there's been some research that, that looked at 15,000 nets being um, removed between uh, up, up per year in, in that area. And um, they reckon up to 15,000 turtles die from one, one net if that net stays in the water for a year. Um, and there was some really interesting research where they, they actually had uh, a turtle that had already died in a net and see, uh, they, they looked at how quickly that, um, that turtle would kind of, you know, degrade and go away. And it was, it was very, very short period of time. So, you know, when we pull a ghost net out, we can see what turtles are in there, but we don't really have any idea of how many turtles died and then degraded while that net was in the water. Um, and it was quite surprising how quickly that actually happened. There's not that much research being done in other areas or not as much information about ghost nets in other areas of Australia than there is in the Gulf of Carpentaria. So um, we were finding hundreds and hundreds of these beacons, these GPS beacons during our beach cleanups, particularly in Cape York and in remote areas. And we really had no idea where they were coming from. Some of them were attract to, uh, attached to fish aggregating devices, so they were either on kind of little rafts or um, chunks of float or bits of rope. Um, and we know that those fads are, are used to kind of accumulate smaller fish underneath them because they're used as protection and then bigger fish come and then bigger fish and bigger fish. And so therefore it's easy for them to um, then be fished because you know where they are. And these uh, trackers, some of them are so sophisticated that they actually have echo sounders on them 
that can tell the tonnage of a particular species of tuna uh, by the echo sounder uh, looking at it. So it can tell that there might be 64 tonnes of dog tube tuna under this particular uh, fad and tracker and there might be 72 tonnes of you know another type of um, tuna under another net. So they know when they're going to come and actually fish underneath those, those fads. They don't use this in the Australian commercial fishing industry. It's not allowed, but they do use it in the South Pacific. Um, and some of these tracker numbers are that we've, we've heard in research is between 45,000 and 65,000 of these deep being deployed in the South Pacific alone every year. So it's not surprising that we're finding hundreds and hundreds of them washing up in remote beaches uh, when you have that many numbers that is being deployed. We didn't know where they were coming from. We don't know how to recycle them. We didn't know how to repurpose them. Uh, and all of our efforts to reach out to the international fisheries actually went on deaf ears and we, we didn't really have any feedback on how we were going to use them. And then one of our um, entrepreneurial staff members decided to pull one apart, which was not the easiest of uh, processes, and itemised all the bits in the, uh, in the tracker itself. And from there we were able to reach back to the major supplier of one of these trackers. Um, and there was a, an email that you know, didn't get responded to and, uh, and then another email went that said, oh, we were going to sell all these bits and pieces in the black market because they're actually really good IT. And we got an email straight away and said, we would prefer that you don't do that, let's have a meeting. <laughs> so we actually got their attention and, uh, and what Project Recon is has developed from that initial conversation. So it's a collaboration between Tangaroa Blue and a company called Satlink. They are based in Spain and they are one of the major suppliers of these types of um, trackers to the tuna industry. Um, basically, a fishing fleet can have a certain amount of them on their boat. They deploy them um, and then they use them to fish. If they float outside of the fishing grounds or they, you know, don't, they stop working for some whatever reason, the, um, the vessel may not want to go and get them. So they just drift out, they drift into the Coral Sea and then some of them end up within the Great Barrier Reef and then some of them end up on our, our beaches. Now it's kind of interesting because even though we found them on the beach, technically the fishing fleet knows where they are, so they still own them. So we can't just take them and say, well now they're ours, we're going to use them. There has to be some kind of handover process and that's where Satlink was able to come on board and, and really help us out. And so this was developed. So Project Recon now has 100 fishing vessels, international fishing vessels from 22 fishing fleets, including the biggest ones in the world, who have said, if Tangaroa Blue finds one of your trackers on an Australian beach, then we give permission for you to reassign ownership to Tangaroa Blue. So that's pretty impressive that they've actually got that level of commitment from the international fishing fleets. So what do we do with them? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what do we do with them? Well, Satlink helps us to go through some testing, first of all. Um, so if the tracker is from one of these um, fishing fleets that have signed up, we do some testing. We make sure that it's structurally in, intact, that it's still going to be working. And Satlink tests the um, GPS and the satellite to make sure that it's still communicating to the satellite. And if those two things are a go, then we can then distribute the tracker to one of our Australian Marine Debris Initiative marine partners. And those partners can be commercial uh, fishing vessels, they can be charter operators, they can be research vessels, they can be government uh, vessels. We have a really, um, really amazing relationship with Border Force who are using them. So um, anybody that works on the ocean um, that has a vessel can say, yes, we want to be part of Project Recon and we will then provide them with one of these trackers. Now, the tracker is then left on the boat as long as it stays you know, in the sun the solar panels stay charged, so then it's operational. And that's one of the really good features with these. They're not battery operated. As long as they're in the sun, they're gonna work. Um, and so one of the other trackers that has been used in the past, you know, the battery has to get changed every three to six months. Um, you know, if the battery goes flat, then they lose the net. This one, we don't have that problem because it has solar panels that operate the satellite and, and um, keep that going. So the idea is that if one of our marine operators that has one of these beacons on their boat comes across a ghost net that they can't immediately remove because it's too big, they can immediately attach the tracker to the net. So what we normally find is that somebody will come across a ghost net, by the time they get back to port and report it, 
and a vessel that's big enough to do something about it is found and goes out to the last point of contact, guess what's happened? It's not there anymore, <laughs> nobody can find it. But this allows the vessel to immediately attach the tracker. They just let us know it's been deployed. We switch the satellite on from the database portal that we have and we have continuous 24-7 surveillance of this net until we can get a vessel out there that will actually go and pick it up. So it won't get lost anymore. One of the other really cool things is that we can set up a virtual fence. And that means if the trajectory of that net looks like it's going to come into a shipping lane or onto a sensitive reef, we can set up a, a line and say, as soon as it gets within 10 nautical miles or five nautical miles of this point, we want to be notified. And it'll start giving us alerts that we need to escalate that response and we need to make sure that it's um, you know, not going to end up on the reef. And we can let um, skippers in the area know that there's uh, a big ghost net floating into the shipping lane so that they don't run over it as well. So there's a lot of different um, ways that we can use this. Um, you know, we're just talking at the moment about tracking ghost nets to make sure that they don't get lost. But there's a lot of other things that potentially we could use it for. If we have another Brisbane flood, we could deploy trackers within the floodwaters and they will give us an idea where cleanup effort needs to happen. Um, you know, you could even use them for safety purposes. Could you imagine if a uh, cruise ship had one on there? Somebody fell overboard, they could throw the tracker out straight away, switch it on, and then they know exactly where they would need to come back. Like there are so many potential opportunities to repurpose this amazing piece of tech technology. You know, they cost about 10 grand US each, and, and they were just going to landfill or nobody could do anything with them. So kind of the sky's the limit with this. So there's just some um, pictures of the testing that we do. Obviously they've got cracks in them, they can't be repurposed. We do a test. Um, make sure they can turn on and off. And as long as they've been in the sun for 48 hours and the solar panels will be charged and they'll be ready to go. Um, so this is a photo of our first deployment, very exciting. We had the Australian Border Force guys uh, found a net in the Gulf of Carpentaria off Weeper. They had one of our trackers, so it was immediately deployed. And we were able to keep an eye on this uh, fad for uh, three weeks while a, a massive vessel was able to come down with a crane and they were able to be able to pull, um, pull out three tonnes of ghost gear. So for us, this is great. It was proof of concept, it works. So you can see that's uh, the deployed boy and there's the guys um, attaching it to the fad. And uh, that's the three ton of ghost gear that we've got removed out. And what was kind of exciting was that um, they had seen this fad for 12 months and every time somebody went to go and get it after it had been spotted again, um, they lost it. So that was the exact problem that we were able, able to solve. Anything that can't be repurposed because it's broken, we're working with the plastics industry to recycle and the e-waste, obviously, to recycle that as well. So that's exciting. Um, and so currently we have 20 boys that are out there. We've got them across Carpentaria, uh, Gulf of Carpentaria, Cape York, out of Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands, and even up in uh, um, Papua New Guinea on the conflict islands. Uh, we've got lots of partners that are hosting them. So if you find one and you want to donate to us, let us know. If you've got a boat and you want to host one, let us know and we can sort that out for you as well. So that's Project Recon. I forgot to keep the timer on. <laughs> Any questions? Right down the back. End use, sorry, so that their end use as conservation tool can be factored in at the design and maybe improvements can be made with that consciousness in mind. Um, we haven't talked to them about redesigning because everything we want it to do, it does. So if we, yeah. if we don't have, if we find something that it's not able to do, then absolutely. One of the things that we are trying to work on is when I said that it can have a look at the tuna underneath and give a tonnage, right? So we want to kind of use that way of assessing what's under it to find a conversion rate. So it gives us an idea of what that means from a ghost net setting. Because then it'll let us know what kind of vessel we need to pull it out. But at the moment, we need to collect a whole heap of net and see what the um, how it assesses that from the echo sounder and then how that translates to actually what it is. So there is a research project there. Cool. Supplementary question. Sure. Um, are you mapping the ghost net, I presume you are, uh, collection uh, so that um, the patterns of where
where they end up relative to fishing industry activity. Yes. Builds a, a knowledge base that could be used to ultimately stop them ending up where they are. Yes. There is a um, an organisation in the South Pacific called the South Pacific Community that is based on development for the islands and they were doing a whole heap of research on these fads and these trackers. Australia was a data gap. So we were able to go, <laughs> we've got like 20 years of data on all this and they were like, this, that's exciting. There was already a paper published using all of that and that's looking at where the last known spot of those trackers were, what that GPS point was and then they, where they actually ended up. And from there we can start looking at which fishing grounds are being impacted. So yeah, that's going to be added on board. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. My name's Marilyn Pennington. I'm, I'm new to all of this and I'm in absolute awe. I'm just keen to know your uh, funding source. Who keeps you on the seas and who provides your boats? Well, I can't see where you're talking. Can you wave at me? I'll take that. Sorry. I was like, where's the voice coming from? Thank you. Uh, look, we're a registered charity and like everybody, we are working on ways of getting funding from a whole variety of things. So we write grants. We do fee-for-service work, we have tenders, we take public donations, we even sell rubbish um, for artists. So we just try and diversify our, diversify our funding stream as much as we can. But, you know, we're always looking for the next dollar to keep things going. Well, thank you all very much. You've got a few minutes if you've got to leave here and go to another session. And Heidi, that was just phenomenal. Thank you. Excellent work. Thank you very much. Well done.